Hello and welcome to another session of TMIS Academy, where we're working towards building a digital knowledge bank, which initiates a cross-country, cross-culture, and cross-discipline learning exchange with global thought leaders. Today we have with us Professor Lucy Corin, who is a fiction writer. She's the program director for the creative writing program at the University of California at Davis. She's the author of two short story collections, 100 Apocalypses and Other Apocalypses, The Entire Predicament, and the novel Everyday Psycho Killers, A History for Girls. She was an Academy, sorry, she was an American Academy for Arts and Letters, John Guerre Writers Fund, Rome Prize Fellow at the American Academy in Rome in 2012 and 13, and a, recipi and a recipient for the 2016 Fellowship in Literature from the National Endowment for the Arts. Her second novel and fourth book of fiction, The Swank Hotel, is out next year, and we're really looking forward to it. Thank you, Professor, for joining us today. Thanks so much for um, letting me be part of your amazing project. Um, thank you. I'm Ritambhara. I'm going to be moderating this session. Some of my interests include children's literature, translation, the intersection of text and images, text and music. And uh, before I go to graduate school uh, in a year or two, I'm doing a capstone thesis on uh, water in Amrita Patil's graphic novels under Professor Jonathan Gill Harris. So that's, that's about it. And um, without further ado, let's get started, Professor. So I read the title of your collection, 100 Apocalypses and Other Apocalypses, and I giggled a little. I don't know if that was an appropriate response, but the idea that an apocalypse is an everyday event, something as banal as, say, nights in A Thousand and One Nights, for example, was quite amusing to me. But uh, now that we're living through an apocalyptic event, the pandemic, uh, do you find yourself going back to the book? Has it uh, changed your relationship with the book, perhaps? And uh, how is it different to write about an apocalypse and actually live through one? Yeah, um, yeah, it's true. I, I finished the book. I did the final edits on it in 2012. And then when I read from it, um, originally when it first came out, I remember how different it felt to read from it when I was in New Orleans. Um, and people who were there had lived through Katrina, the um, horrific hurricane that decimated so many people's um, lives. And how it felt, um, it, it made me want to read it with a different sound in my head than I had always written it with. And I think that might have something to do with your relationship with the title. There's something in the book that is a little, that's a little coy in the voice a lot. There's a little bit of snark because I'm really um, often sort of um, obsessed with or interested in um, the way that people put fronts on, you know, especially uh, uh, watching it, watching the way that people, um, uh, use language to mask themselves online a lot. Um, in any case, uh, there is something about like the, lit, the a sort of snarky know-it-allness that um, that's part of the voice of the book that I was playing with a lot. And you're right, in contrast to like the immense, um, the magnitude of the purported subject matter. Um, but I tried to, to I tried to come at the the different stories with as vast an array of tones and modes of thinking as I had the capacity to record. And part of it was to invoke a sense of play, of thinking about and fantasizing about the end of things, which is what I was noticing everybody doing all the time. Um, I mean, right now, living through the times that we're living it through, um, I'm just, um, I mean, I'm just stumped. Like as a human being, I'm stumped and I, I don't know, I don't know yet what my writing will feel like um, that tries to engage this time now. And it's one of the things I've been working on in these weeks where I'm preparing to teach again. Um, I'm trying to figure out like how, how to both like encourage students to try to make a record of what, of the texture of now and language Mm -hmm. um, while also being able to like um, embrace the structures of craft and storytelling that 
um, that they that they'd loved enough to bring to them to the place where they wanted to write, and that seems that feels really different to me. Um, okay. I mean, in terms of living through the apocalypse, I mean, your guess is I'm sure much better than mine. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing that with us, and uh, yeah. we we sure all of us do feel some. I, I don't want to call it hopelessness because there is some hope. That's how we're living through it, but. Um, there's something very um, numbing about that. Uh, but, and talking about uh, the events that you've written about that have actually taken place, uh, the yeah. apocalyptic events, uh, I wanted to talk about the California fire. And uh, you've sort of written about something like that in your book, uh, The Godzilla and Smog Master. And yeah. um, the, in, in uh, Dream Material, you touch upon the politics of calling a country developing. And uh, in another one of your stories, people are jobless and without health insurance. Uh, so I wanted to talk about the subtle, witty, almost airy way in which uh, politics finds space in your stories. Do you consciously seek to diverge from the existing overt debates on the political in your writing? Or is it something that comes naturally to you? Um, I definitely try to make fiction be about the kinds of things that other forms of discourse aren't about. So I think there are people out there engaged in political debates in ways that are beyond my capacities. And I think that there are ways that, um, that people come head on toward um, like ideas that, that like uh, would, would bear fruit in policy or in um, political or activism and I see the my relationship to those things as things I have to negotiate as a person but as a fiction writer um I feel like the thing I need to do is include what's in life you know like include it uh that uh that that people are without health insurance or is in my stories because people are without health insurance <laughs> and it would feel um it would feel uh like i wasn't paying attention if if they if they weren't on the page in some way um but i try to do something with the political facts of our our daily life um that's that's for the page and for language in a way that's distinct from from other forms um, so, uh, so it's much more in the realm of, uh, sort of, uh, thought projects. They're sort of like, like my, my approach is like, say somebody thought about it like this, or say somebody thought about it like that and play it out because stories dramatize things that are, um, just ideas. And so it's the way that I think I can think about political things best. But um, but I don't think of my work as something that is there to teach other people how to think. It's more to sort of point out things that are in the world and draw attention to them in dramatic ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, speaking about distinctiveness, uh, your writings are often without a traditional beginning, middle, and an end. And while you write about apocalypses and endings, I find it very interesting that there are no emphatic endings um, to a lot of your stories. Uh, it's almost as if they're en route to another story. So, yeah. you know, often connected by a thread or perhaps just a word. I'm assuming yeah. a lot of planning goes into that. So could you perhaps speak a bit about your writing process? Well, when you, when you say planning, what are you picturing? Um, perhaps you sitting by your desk or wherever you write and... Uh, just doing the writing? Well, um, I mean, what it, what I do a lot of is, um, is, uh, is organizing. So what I do a lot is writing things intuitively uh, because it feels good, because I'm interested in it, because it amuses me, because it cracks me up, because I would never tell anybody that I thought this even for a second, so I may as well write it down, and then I don't have to show anybody if I don't want to, right? Like, I, this, this, I, I try to make my writing space um, a kind of sacred private space, the kind of space where um, 
where I can do things without consequence and I can do things without being judged for them. And I can just really see what happens. So I try to generate a lot of material that way. And then a lot of the crafting of the stories, or in this case, crafting of the sequence of stories, is about um, a lot of trial and error of arrangement and seeing what kinds of harmonics happen and what kinds of um, what kinds of implicit cause effect happen when you lay things next to each other that maybe could be laid next to other things. So it's collage work. So I do a lot of that. But in terms of beginnings and endings, I mean, I love the way that you describe it because it is what I want the feeling of the book to be like, that it's sort of like opens and closes and opens and closes and that beginnings become endings, become beginnings, become endings. I wanted that feeling of moving through the little stories. Um, and I also wanted to make sure that I began things really differently from each other and that I ended things really differently from each other because the apocalypse is both about the end of things and about the imagined beginnings of things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So the way that I approached writing the stories was connected um, to the subject matter that I was trying to approach through writing. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting way to look at it. And um, the effect of that has uh, often been described as titillating or experimental or frightening. Uh, is, is that a desired effect when you write do you expect people to have that sort of a reaction and uh, how would you describe your writing well i mean how would i describe it i mean i i i have a hard time describing it and what i tend to do is i mean one of the luxuries of having had a couple of books out is that you've been described sometimes and so i can steal the ways that i've been described that i appreciate and that i like um so i i do think that I would think, I would hope it was less maybe titillating than like, it, I like to think that it embraces the sensationalistic, but with a smartness about the sensational. Like I want it to be fun. I want it to be um, surprising. I want it to be funny, um, but I want it to be those things in the service of making, making people look hard at things or look at things in a, in a, in a new, look at ordinary things in a new way or think about things in a way that surprises them mm. or feel, react in an emotional way that they wouldn't have expected themselves to react. So, I mean, that's my, that's my hope for, for what the stories can do. Um, uh, but I sort of think of them as like embracing the sensationalist more than more than titillating and I forgot the other hilarious adjectives but <laughs> <laughs> yeah no in its uh, uncanniness and um, your exploration of the unconscious uh, in fact uh, I read a piece by you where you've just spoken about nightmares and what other people you know describe as nightmares and I thought it was really fun and um, it reminded me a lot of Freud and um, the way you relate form and content in your writing um, was very reminiscent to me of um, Samuel Beckett. And you have in the past spoken about Lydia Davis's influence on your writing. Uh, so who are some writers that have inspired you and your writing? And um, what kind of a writer do you want to be? And what are some of your literary beliefs? Um, so, uh, yeah, Beckett's great. And I like his, um, I, I like the, I like the um, challenge to create form and content unity. And I strive for that in everything that I do. Um, it, uh, things that I, I think one of the questions in there was things, things that I want writing to do, things that I want writing to, to do. Um, Well, I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I really think that in a time when so much of our lives is, a, and the way that we tell stories to each other is um, the different kinds of storytelling that happen on the internet that are based in 
you know, the, the form of whatever little box the social media platform is having you present your little story in. Like those are forms of narrative and, you know, movies and television and all those little versions of it that are happening on YouTube that I don't know anything about because it's not my generation um, and, and gaming and all of these four ways that people tell stories to each other um, uh, are, um, I want, I want writing on the page to be trying to do things that only it can do, that these other forms of storytelling aren't doing. So that's, there's a lot of different ways to do that, but it means that I'm in love with the sentence, that I think that the different ways that sentences can begin and end and what they do in the middle is, cher is a cherished space. Um, I think that, and so I think that writing should care about the sentence as a unit of thought and as a unit of time. Um, and I think that the, that, so I think the materiality of the book, the way that it, the way that it, the amount of space it takes up and the way that you move page by page should be um, a core part of the experience, that it shouldn't feel the same if it's translated into other media because other media is so gorgeous at doing the things that it does. So that's one of the things that I think about. Yeah, um, something, um, sorry, go ahead. No, no, you continue. Yeah, no, so I was just um, going to say that something that I have uh, observed in uh, many of your stories is that you have a soundtrack uh, or, mm -hmm. you know, something the characters have been listening to on repeat or uh, someone's, you know, some music that's playing in the background. So you also seem to focus a lot on percussive nature of prose. So I was just um, yeah. thinking about, you know, the different... Yeah. Um, things that you patch together in your writing yeah. okay. and when I press return right like when when a new paragraph starts and um, how many breaths come after a, a, a word or after a sentence or after a paragraph or after a space break that I, I do I want those stories to have a beat <laughs> oh, that's, uh, yeah that's uh, that sounds a lot of fun and reading it aloud actually is very it's a fun experience to say the least yeah. And um, uh, another thing that you patch together, um, perhaps not in one single story of yours, but um, across your body of work, is perspectives and narrative mm -hmm. voices. Uh, you yeah. seem to play with the two a lot. And uh, yeah. you have a very interesting short story called uh, First Person, where you talk about writing in the first person. And yeah. um, I, in a lot of your stories, you write in the second and uh, the third person voice. So yeah. where do you think your disinclination to fixedness in perspective and in um, voice comes from? Yeah, I mean, I am definitely like a, a tech geek when it comes to the techniques of short, the short stories. Like I sometimes look at people who are obsessed with how writing code and things that I don't know anything else, anything about. And I'm like, but actually that's what I'm like with like the technical aspects of story writing. So I like, I especially love um, the elasticity of point of view. And I like to see like exactly how many layers of interiority can I tunnel into? Can I, can I, can I make it a first person within a second person, within a third person, within a first person? Like, can, can I layer perspectives like that? And part of that is because what I'm really interested in is the action of the mind, the action of the imagination, and the action of a, of a brain when it's doing its stuff. And I want that to be, I want that movement and that fluidity of perspective to be part of part of the experience of reading things, to feel like things get really, really close and then feel like they move out in some kind of, um, in some kind of pattern. Uh, so yeah, I really do love, love point of view. <laughs> uh, but I also, uh, I also play, have, have worked a lot in the last book that, in the last book that I finished, um, that's not out yet um, on time and move, moving, moving in and out of different modes of imagining time and trying to create certain moments that feel like suspended time, that feel like they don't take place anywhere except in the book, except in like the mind of the reader when they get to that passage. Yeah. Yeah, I think um, this kind of reflects in your uh, content also. So if I mm -hmm. were to talk about um, apocalypses again, 
So, uh, you know, I, I thought it was very uh, fascinating that you write about not the many different ways to live, but uh, many different ways to die and even more ways to imagine how you will die. But yeah. Um, yeah, but I guess like in doing that, what you're doing is m not making your writing about gloom or terrors, it then becomes, um, you know, the prose of possibility, you know? Exactly. And, yeah, yeah, and um, I, find, I found that very refreshing to say the least. And uh, I had a lot of fun going through your short stories. And um, I would love, love it if you could perhaps uh, read us a short fiction of yours. Oh, well, you know, I thought, especially since you mentioned that first person story, and I've, I, I have never, I've never read that story. So yeah. I thought I would read that one. Oh, yeah, it'll be great. Please do. Yeah. You know, it's the very first little story in, um, in my first collection of stories. So it's kind of my first story. Oh, the first person. This is my day in the sun, and I've got my arms in the air, my head tipped back like the hinged lid of a lighter. Contrary to popular belief, I am not alone. Everyone's listening. All I see is the bulging gas above me, and I'm shooting my mind at it. I'm as close to God as I'll ever be. The people are tiny, they're buckshot around my ankles. I could kneel and run my fingers through them. Little story. It was great. Thank you so much, Professor. And thank you so much for sharing all that you have with us. And uh, definitely, we've got some insight into the technicalities of writing. And we, I'm sure a lot of our audiences, um, you know, aspiring story writers, poets, and I feel like a lot of us could use all this insight. And uh, once again, thank you so much for being with us today. We, I had a lovely time chatting with you. I had a great time chatting with you too. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks.